Well, welcome everybody. My name is Chris Harris, and I'm the coordinator of the Flood Ones Landscape Architecture here at AT. And it is my great privilege to welcome you all to the inaugural Dr. Charles Fountain Memorial Lecture Series in conjunction with UC Berkeley. Um, Dr. Charles Fountain was the creator of our program and attended UC Berkeley to obtain a degree in landscape architecture. We brought that love and passion back to ANT and began our program. And we are blessed today to have with us a member from that original class, Mr. Walter Hood, who now actually currently teaches at Berkeley. So we have this kind of typical relationship going on that we're really happy about. Um, to start off, we have some comments from leadership. So we will start with Chancellor Martin. Good morning. And I guess it's afternoon now at this moment. I'm as excited about this conversation uh, as you may be as students as well. Uh, we thank you for your uh, presence this morning, uh, this afternoon, as we prepare to engage with one of our distinguished alums, Mr. Walter Hood. Uh, and we have had a great pleasure of engaging with Mr. Hood as well. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the comments he will make as well. I would challenge each of you as you reflect on your own uh, aspirations for the future uh, and thinking about uh, your professional careers, uh, and starting your own businesses, creating your own practices, uh, licensure, uh, graduate education, all of the important aspects of the educational experiences you are now gaining here at North Carolina NT State University. I challenge you to think big. I now challenge you to think beyond uh, the areas of influence that you may have had thus far in your careers. There are significant possibilities and opportunities as uh, Mr. Hood will share with you in his comments, I'm sure. Uh, but it's a critically important uh, that you take full advantage of opportunities like these to engage in very powerful, meaningful conversations to you collectively as a group, but uh, uh, individually as you individually think about your own aspirations for the future as well. Uh, and I think I can share without con with a great deal of confidence uh, that Mr. Hood, like myself, uh, as we once sat in seats like you now sit on this campus, uh, the educational experiences and opportunities this university has afforded both Mr. Hood and me have served us incredibly well. Uh, but on top of the opportunities the institution affords us, there is an expectation that you will take advantage of these remarkable opportunities as well. So again, in an exciting way, thank you for joining us and being part of this discussion. Uh, I encourage you to ask uh, engaging questions of Mr. Hood, as I'm sure he will be more than happy to respond. Again, welcome. Thank you, Chancellor. Dean Amanda. All right, uh, good morning, Mr. Hood. I know it's the morning in California still, so good morning and welcome home, I would say. Uh, needless to say that we are very proud of you and your accomplishment. And uh, before I get any further, let me also thank Chancellor Martin for joining us today. Despite his busy schedule, he made sure that he is here to welcome you. And then that's uh, a testament of the importance that he places on, on you and in your engagement uh, with your alma mater here at North Carolina a and State University. So on behalf of the faculty, students, and staff, I would like to welcome you and thank you very much for uh, your uh, clear desire to give back. And we certainly appreciate that. Um, you're, um, we are certainly delighted to re -engage, that you're engaging with our faculty and our students uh, to keep and revive the legacy of uh, Charles Fountain who is the founder of the program uh, and who's a, uh, who's been instrumental in getting it to start from scratch for a long time. So um, we know that we are standing on the shoulders of pioneers like him and then yourself as the first graduate of the first cohort back in 18, 1981. And uh, for that you and Dr. Fountain are part of the DNA of the program, I would say. Um, so uh, as a first cohort, as they say that the first cohort does represent, sets expectation and brand of the program. And by all measures, there is a success in that first cohort. 
uh, in, uh, in your uh, personal success as a graduate of the program. And the fact that the program went on to be the only undergraduate landscape architecture program here in North Carolina and the top producer of African-American with, um, with degree in landscape architecture. So uh, the bar is set high for you students, but I have all the confidence that you will follow your own way and find your own notoriety through your own you know, career path. And uh, this, this lecture series is certainly a great way to inspire our students as uh, they start their professional careers. And, uh, and I certainly look forward to you continue to engage with us and then branch out in other areas that, that are of mutual interest. And uh, I won't take it long. I just want to thank you again and welcome you to Aggieland, uh, be it virtually at this time. Hopefully next time we will in, uh, get you here in person and then have the privilege of hosting you. So welcome again and certainly look forward to hearing uh, the, the lecture and what comes after. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Dr. Goins, the department chair. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Chancellor Martin, Dean of Medina, certainly uh, Mr. Hood and UC Berkeley and all of those involved to, to make this happen. Um, and to the new freshmen out there, uh, I'm the guy uh, that you might have heard about. I'm Gregory Goins, professor and chair of the Department of Natural Resource and Environmental Design. The upperclassmen know me well, and I'm privileged to know all of you. So stop by my office all anytime. So uh, today marks a momentous day for the department as we have uh, the privilege to have one of our most acclaimed graduates of the Anti-Landscape Architecture Program. And uh, today to spear the Charles uh, Fountain Memorial Lecture Series um, between a and and Berkeley. And uh, particularly with um, Mr. Hood and his work that uh, looks at uh, landscape architecture probe, how race, memory, and meaning intersect in the American landscape. So me personally, just not only as a chair, but as a, um, as a, a child from East Greensboro, this has a, has a lot of personal meaning as opposed as I was also with the scholarship. So uh, already, uh, I, if I may put in a plug, it's, it's a must, it's a must have read to get a copy of uh, Dr. Hood's uh, Black Landscapes Matter. Um, that's where I, I've learned a lot, even though I'm not a landscape architect per se, but quickly you will become up to see where the, the race and landscape and culture all intersect. And so like the instructor um, uh, for Mr. Uh, Hood, uh, Dr. Fountain, uh, Mr. Hood is an innovator, educator, and a visionary, visionary landscape architect. So it's a real pleasure to, uh, that we have Mr. Hood to amplify and further opportunities for our students that builds off Dr. Fountain's dedication to a and So thank you. Thank you, leadership, and thank you for those comments and words. Uh, now we'll have my colleague Steve Hansen come to formally introduce Mr. Walter. So it's a huge pleasure to introduce Walter because I had the pleasure of being first and foremost one of his students um, and then one of his colleagues. Um, and both experiences, particularly being his student, really changed who I am as a landscape architect. So I think you've heard a lot from our leadership about his accomplishments. So I really want to mostly introduce him by talking about how he does his work, but just to put the point on the head of accomplishments, go check out the website, pages and pages of awards from the Rome Prize to the MacArthur Genius Award. We want to talk dollars and cents, more than a million and a half dollars of prizes in the last two years. So he sets the bar high and basically what Walter's experience shows you is as an Aggie landscape architect, there is no ceiling. You can do anything. And Walter is quite literally the most decorated landscape architect in America. So that's where you should aim to be as well. So what really impressed me as Walter's student, and I hope impresses you, isn't what he's designed, but how he designs it. Particularly because Walter's method is very replicable. His projects are magical, but the process isn't magic. You can do it too. And that's what makes his work profound. So in the first week of studio, Friday, Walter assigns us to do three models of a 1,500-foot mountain um, in hand-cut chipboard, and we're only allowed to change 1% of the mountain. 
So at about two in the morning on Sunday, I'm starting to feel like this is really crazy. And why am I doing only 1%? But by about 4 a.m., I realized that Walter had made me really listen to the land, to really understand what this hill was about, and that I only had to do something very small to accentuate what was there, to lift the voice of the mountains. And the next project that we did was the landscape around the Memphis Arena. So we were really focusing on program. How can an arena make place? He asked us to make nine scaled models of the arena and how you could create a different form to create a different place. Again, at about two in the morning, this was getting a little gnarly. Um, but before the sun came up, I broke out of the box and started to really listen to what an arena could be. Like, what is an arena? How does it function? What, how does it make an experience? And created things that I never would have imagined, um, as did my you know, brother and sister students. And then maybe finally, and most importantly, our next project, so this is our third project in the first half of the studio. We really had to listen to the people of a place, the people of the past, the people of the present, and the people who are coming. And Walter asked us to do this by creating a collage of the essence of the place, not a representation of the place. It couldn't look like the place. It was what was the essence? What was the human essence of the place? So we had to listen to those voices, voices long past, voices yet to come, and somehow represent them abstractly, which meant we had to find their very essence. So when you listen to Walter present his work, listen for how his landscape architecture speaks the voices, raises the voices of the place, of the program, and the people. And that's really the challenge that he gave to us as students and Chris and Dallas and I hope to give you as students, if you listen and really create designs that speak all those voices, they will be deeply profound and they will speak to your audience. But listening and creating landscapes that listen isn't easy. And that's why Walter's special. But I think what really makes him special for us is that's a method we can learn. We can all learn to listen. So if you can take this back to studio and make sure that in your next project, you can hear the site, you can hear the program, and you can hear the people, it will be a great success. So it's a pleasure, Walter, that you can be here in person to start teaching us your method. And I look forward to seeing you soon in person. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Um, thanks, Chancellor. It's great to see you again, Dean and Chair. It's a pleasure, um, students and faculty, to one, uh, to come back to A&T virtually, <laughs> but to also try to figure out how I and my program here can be part of your education. So over the next year, what we've um, tried to create is a lecture series that will go from February 2022 to February 2023. I've talked <laughs> my colleagues into giving lectures. So all of my colleagues from the department in landscape architecture and environmental planning has signed up to give lectures to you based on their research and their interest. I also pulled another Aggie who's working on one of my projects, who's the project manager. He's actually going to give a lecture as well of what it means to be a project manager on the other side of building a landscape. So we hope that these lectures can augment your education but more importantly, I'm hoping that the lecture series can actually push you guys and get you to kind of think about all possibilities. And I would just say one thing, if during my lecture or any other lecture, if there are things that just seem so abstract to you or things that are just not clear, go with it. <laughs> Challenge your professors to push you to sort of understand these concepts because these are one of the ideas that we're trying to put forward. You know, I think when I was in school, the professional school is basically teaching you certain skills of how to be a landscape architect. And one of the things I've learned over time is you also need to layer in a liberal arts education. And these are things that 
are not about making landscape. These things are about seeing the world differently, right? And expanding your mind. This might be literature, music, other types of educational sort of elements. And so I would push you to do that. The second part of uh, our, our work together will be a summer internship program where we know you have affiliations with some firms here, but we're trying to put together a program where we invite at least a half dozen Aggies out to the Bay Area to work in our summer program and then help you develop your portfolio, not for graduate school, but also for work. And those who will come in will be mentored by myself and my office during that year. And we will try this. If it doesn't happen this summer, we will do it the summer of 2023. But again, I'm really excited to be here with you and to share some ideas. I'm gonna share my screen now. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. And again, Dr. Charles Fountain was this amazing person in my life. I didn't know it as a student, and this is just students. <laughs> um, at times I hated Dr. Fountain. He was a tough man. <laughs> he made me do a lot of things that I didn't wanna do. <laughs> he made me work. And when I say made, I mean made. Uh, he made me work in the summertime um, on the farm. He, he made me go spend a semester away from school and do co-op education in the Blue Ridge Parkway. Um, and then he made me go to Washington, D.C. to take a job. And I say made for a reason. He basically challenged me. He didn't give me choices. He said, if you do these things, you will be a better designer and you will be a better student. And in those days, this is like 40 years ago, those, those words still sort of reverberate with me today. And, you know, 40 years ago, this idea of, minorities in landscape architecture, it was like really novel. You know, that's me in the middle, that kind of blurred guy with no dreads. Um, you know, it was just a novel thing. And when we joined the program, it was something very new. I came out of architecture engineering because I heard landscape architecture, there's this new profession. But none of us knew what we were getting into. And in a way that ignorance, I think, allowed myself actually to look at the profession in a very different way as I, as my career grew. But two things I think for me, you know, this is more recently in the last 20 years, you know, 40 years ago, there wasn't this clear critique, right, of how we were situated in this culture, meaning people of color. You know, an HBCU back then, it was like, you go to a and you know, it was like, it wasn't just an HBCU. It was, you know, these were black colleges and you wanted to go and be around people who were like yourself. But in the last 20 years or so, this idea of really thinking about how can a country that's been separated, literally, for most of its origin, you know, how do you actually begin to I wouldn't say heal, but how do you begin to critique and try to understand these things? And so I did this little diagram for myself a couple of years ago. And I was interested in all the things that I learned in landscape architecture from you know, colonial landscapes, Mount Vernon, Monticello, University of Virginia, Brooklyn Botanical Garden, the big Central Park, all of these things that were being created in landscape architecture. If I think of my ancestors, where were they when all of this was happening? During these big sort of origin stories of landscape, we were isolated and excluded. We were either enslaved or we were either excluded during Jim Crow. And even during the 20th century, this idea of partitioning and duplication, there were a separate set of landscapes. And so when I'm talking today about hybridity and hybrid landscapes, I want us to recognize that Throughout this country, there has been this double semiotic. And what I mean by that, there's been these dualities, these dualities of symbols. So certain things mean certain things to certain people, and they might mean certain things to other people. But there's also been this double consciousness that Du Bois talks about, that a lot of us have had to wear a veil. And that veil actually creates an identity that people see you coming, therefore they treat you a certain way. And over time, we actually adopt that and we somehow lose our identity. And I would argue that for people of color and even in gender, over time, that double semiotic and double consciousness has actually made us more resilient because we're able to do multiple things at the same time. 
where a lot of people who are privileged, they're only looking through a single lens. The other idea of the hybrid landscape is there is no origin, we can't go back. And Richard White at Stanford, he talks about this idea that the landscapes are already formed, right? And this idea of trying to go back then and fix things, we're, we're moving forward, it's entropic. So in a way, how do we think about this conjunctive beauty? And even in our landscapes, they're hybridized in the way we talk about them and culturally in how we change them. And so in my book that I'm working on, Hybrid Landscapes, we look at three things that come out of linguistics. One, reflexive borrowing, mimetic appropriation, and exchange and inventions. And I would argue that a lot of this reflexive borrowing, when we see streets, squares, plaza, and things like that, they're all coming from someplace else, mostly Europe right, Western European, these ideas. And this notion of borrowing then, how do those things take up meaning? Then we have this idea of mimetic appropriations that certain things like the garden, I would say, the lot, the yard, these are things that we share. I know when I was growing up in North Carolina and even in South Carolina, blacks and whites together, we actually stole from one another and you actually see this as part of that culture. So when you go to certain parts of the South, you start to see people actually mimicking one another and you actually see these things actually being transformed. And lastly, I would argue that the park is an American invention and the park is actually proclaimed before the wilderness. So what does that really mean then? When we have Central Park before we have the national parks. So that again means that we're looking at nature again through a separate lens. So I'm gonna talk about two ways in which I think about the hybrids through projects. And then I'm gonna take you through a process of a couple of projects so you can actually see how we're actually making decisions. The first is this idea of the conscious hybrid, right? This creates an ironic double consciousness. It's a collision between two different points of view. And internally, there's this dialogical fusing of things that don't go together. What do I mean by that? You will see sometimes a plaza park. How is that possible? right, or a park that has a square, that we put these two things together. And as I started working on Lafayette Square Park in downtown Oakland, what we were able to see is that in the beginning, it was called Lafayette Square, that someone gave the city an acre and a half of land, and they said, it's a square. And at the top of this thing, you can kind of see the square was designed with a cross axe. And this was pretty typical for plazas as well on the East Coast and squares on the plazas on the West Coast and squares on the East Coast. But over time, uses started happening in the square that people hated. Like there were people selling things, there might have been prostitutes, there were people sort of doing things that you didn't want. So the first thing that happened in America where the squares got green, we put in lawn. <laughs> and once you put in lawn, over time, people started then seeing it as a park, right? You have to remember parks were created in America, they had to be greater than 500 acres. So all of a sudden now we have a park that's an acre and a half. But this is because people saw it. And over time, people then pushed the city to put those amenities in. And so the square park then becomes this hybrid where there's enough lawn, there's enough vegetation, but there's also enough paved areas. And once you understand that, you're then able to see why people see landscapes in different ways. This is Splash Pad Park. Again, this was never a park. It was a traffic island. Once people saw trees in green, people started calling it park and therefore the bureaucracy began to build into it. And again, once you understand this, then you can push these projects in any, you can push against this idea of a park being small, or you can say, how do I make a small thing a park? Or what are the accoutrements for a park? Or Golden Gate Park here in San Francisco which is a sand dune, a giant sand dune at the edge of the city. It became a park just by bringing dirt and trees in. But if you take a bottle of water out there, pour it into the ground, it's still sand and it will evaporate, it's still a sand dune. Or in Los Angeles, the Broad Plaza is actually an upturned beam highway where we put 110 year old olive trees in to say that it's a fiction. And so when people come here, they question, how did these trees get here? And have they been here that long? And then they realize it's actually over a tunnel. So again, beginning to use this idea of the hybrid to get people to actually see the place in which they live. 
But more importantly to our work, the hybrid allows us to look at post-colonial landscapes. So these would be plazas, squares, and streets, things that come from that Western idea and push back at them. But what we're more interested in is this idea of the unconscious hybrid. We want to disrupt order, right? We want to get people to think differently. We want to change the words, right? This is a big thing for us now. We don't want to keep using the same nomenclature because that, those terms come from someplace else. How do we find new words that begin to describe places and landscape? How do we build on the historical foundation so sometimes to shock and challenge assumptions? And how do we revitalize and intentionally fuse things that we don't think go together? And again, in this post-colonial moment, I've been thinking a lot about this idea of diversity versus difference. And I choose to go with difference. Like diversity just means you got things that might be just different colors, but I'm talking about difference. I'm talking about things that are really, really different. And can we challenge people that order sometimes is only for the privilege, but this idea of being messy could be, again, a more sustainable way because it suggests that there are different things that actually relate to one another. And one of the first ideas was in my art thesis, this is a bio line. And the term bio line was about having epiphytes fill this gallery on top of a air condition. And these epiphytes don't need dirt, but they're actually cleaning the air as the air is sucked through this building and reflecting the air conditioned duct, right? And so the idea of the line and bio or the eucalyptus soliloquy, right? Which is really thinking about eucalyptus trees in the California area that actually people hate because they, they have high fuel and they don't help with wildfires. And so we thought, well, how can we get people to see the other side of a eucalyptus tree? And so the soliloquy is basically, we took a wire mesh and tied eucalyptus leaves to it. And in the distance is a eucalyptus grove. And every day at three o'clock when the wind comes through, the leaves rustle on our piece and rustles with the trees. And so they're actually having a conversation. And so the soliloquy actually manifests. Or three trees. A few years ago, President Obama is like building a library in south of Chicago. And citizens are like, how dare him tear down trees in the park? And they forget Washington and Lincoln are already there in the park. So we actually took the trees and actually made three trees, one for Washington, one for Lincoln, and you can guess which one's for Obi. But this idea, again, <laughs> really thinking about these ideas and how one can bring and get people to see the world differently, right? And sometimes forcefully, but also beautifully. Or the solar strand. You know, a strand runs next to uh, an ecological hydrological unit. So along the edges of the ocean, you have strands. Along rivers, you have strands. And so we're working, we were invited to do a competition in Buffalo, New York on the campus. And they had 5,000 PV panels. And they asked Vito Akanchi, another designer, and myself to submit projects for it. And we did this research and we found in this map that the campus was created by a, land, a well-known landscape firm and they moved the creek. They moved an entire creek to put the campus there and they removed all the topsoil. So there was no more recharging. And so of course, nothing could grow there. The trees, when I went there, all the ball and burlap were still there. It's 25 years old, 30 years old. And so we thought about this idea of bringing back the strand. And so we located, again, these PV in a quarter mile stretch set them in this landscape and let the landscape go. And when you stop cutting this landscape, it actually started regenerating. And now it's a wildlife refuge. And as they were going out to, to sort of look at the landscape and a hawk came down and pulled a groundhog out, right? And they were like, wow, you can actually have technology and this wildness together. And now it's become the gateway to the university. And it's also a place where people can gather we only use recycled materials. All the concrete you see on the ground comes from buildings that have been sort of teared down. And every Earth Day, the campus comes out and this is their new gateway. Or the crying stone St. Monica tears. You know, I've always thought in Los Angeles, you know, why are all the saints in Los Angeles, right? Santa Monica, who was she, right? St. Monica came to California. She cried for the soldiers and a garden grew, right? The soldiers were drinking. So they were inebriated 
and the garden actually gave them this new place. So in Santa Monica, we stack six foot pieces of stone on the public sidewalk. So people pass by this landscape that's beneath the ground that's actually been neutered. And now they see the real cliffs in which the natives were thrown over by the, um, by the Spaniards. And as the project was about to open, a Tonga elder, one of the Indian of the local Indians, we had this conversation. She said, Mr. Hood, you know, I really love your St. Monica tears, but we call it the crying rock. And then she went into the story about her ancestors being thrown over the cliff, but how the rock still basically has this memory. And so we changed the name and it has this duality now. And every day at sunset, the shadow hits the gold wall and the garden grows. At the University of Virginia, when the campus wanted to move southward, they actually found 28 bodies interned in this low-lying landscape of Jefferson. And that landscape was a historic place called Canada. It's south of the university, and one of the PhD students at the UVA was doing research, and they had found that Kitty Foster, a free black woman, had purchased this land south of the campus, and she worked as a cleaning woman for the all boys campus. UVA was an all boys school in the beginning. So halfway through the project, I was asked if I would take on you know, this, this piece to talk about the memory of Kitty Foster and her family. And so for the project, we created what we call a shadow catcher. And I was taken by this idea of archeology span that when archeologists go out, they make a grid and they then locate things within this grid. And I was thinking that we don't know, we didn't know much about what was below other than there was some walkways and there was the bodies that were in turn, some in, even included animals. So we created an overhead grid. So when the light hit, a grid would permeate the ground and you would actually see where the house was located. But I also thought about Blotch's idea, flash of the spirit from Congo, this idea of the spirit when you die, you need a ride to heaven. And you see this in New Orleans and some parts of South Carolina. When I was growing up, you went to a cemetery and you carried poinsettias, but you would put the poinsettias down and you would turn the foil back. I never thought about why you turn the foil back, but you turn the foil back. So when the light hits it, you get the spark and the spark is that gateway to heaven, right? And so this project really talks about that kind of folklore, but also those memories, right, that I had growing up, but also things that we actually see in the tidewater landscape. We went around and looked at cemeteries and all of those things. And so again, when the sun comes out, this grid comes out and you see the spark. And so to see the light and shadow together, for us, it's just a very powerful moment as you move through. And then it forces you to look down and then look up, down and look up, which is the ultimate like connection. And just laying out where things were laid out and creating a different scale and a different aesthetic other than brick. And then looking at the cemeteries in the areas or the burial grounds in the areas and noting that most people, when you're buried you know, with wood, if your coffins are wood, basically you create these sinks in the ground. So if you go to the old cemeteries, you'll actually see this beautiful topography. By the topography are the bodies basically decomposing. And so we created this kind of earthwork to talk about the burial. Or in Jackson, Wyoming, they wanted me to create a sculpture trail. And I knew what they really wanted was a walkway to put sculpture on. So we worked with them for two years to talk about terracing in Wyoming. And, and so we looked at movies, <laughs> we read John McPhee, to get them to say, you should talk about landscape and not the actual product. And after a couple of years, we actually moved all the parking back and we created a quarter mile long terrace where you can sit and actually see the bugling moose out in the Snake River. And it's a place where large scale sculpture then can be presented at this other scale. This is Ai Weiwei 12 Zodiacs. In Nashville, we made witness walls. And I hope you're getting the language thing. <laughs> uh, the witness walls, again, was an idea, a competition to think about civil rights in Nashville. And being an Aggie, I mean, I thought we were the first at, with the Woolworths, but 
Evidently, Nashville got, got there faster. Diane Lane and others really challenged the city. Very quickly, they boycotted, and they were actually able to reach um, a deal to basically integrate. So next to City Hall in a fallow space, we created a set of walls to actually talk about this um, point in time. And one of the things that we were privy to were a set of images that someone in the Courier Post, the photographers went out to photograph the agitators of the day, right? But they never published these images. And so a whole sort of slew of these photos were discovered and now they're in the historical society. But as I looked at a lot of these images, I was taken by you know, the courage of the women that you see actually walking these kids to school in this, what I would imagine, this, this gauntlet of hatred. And so instead of sort of doing the normal thing where there's Martin Luther King, you know, the, 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 the people of the movement here was like, we, don't, we want ordinary people, Walter, to be presented here. And so taking some of these images, we then decided to create what I'm thinking of block prints out of concrete, the 20th century material, concrete to me, which again really thinks about or talks about the civil rights movement. And so in these eight foot walls, we then created these blocks using aggregate to create these blocks of people marching. And a lot of them were women and children, completely abstracted. But what we're interested in the tactility of the wall and the presence of the images. And then through these collages that are based on these kind of religious paintings, really trying to tell a different kind of story. And then on the other side, we actually use archival images, see and seed into the wall, so that when the light hits them again, they become almost photo real. So the wall has two sides, one highly abstract and one more photo real. You can kind of see how the image is coming out of the concrete on the left. And then here on the right, you begin to kind of see the two. And so again, thinking about environment, you know, through the day and through the night, how one might experience these things. And this is one of the veterans. Again, we really like that everyone comes up and touches. So again, this idea of the body in relationship. Unbeknownst to us, this is Freddie on the right. Freddie, basically was on uh, the bus that went from Florida to Texas that was bombed three times. And then on opening day, he's pointing at himself. He knew all the time I was using the images, but he never said, that's me, Walter. And on opening day, he came up and said, Walter, that's me. He whispered. And one of the news people sort of saw that and they ran over and Freddie was gone. And it was one of those things where, you know, he didn't want any notoriety at all, right? And to me, that's something for us to learn in the culture today of me, me, me. Right? This next project is in San Bernardino, California. And it's one of the first ones that we've had, um, I guess, the privilege to work on. And this is a memorial to a massacre. And this is from December the 2nd, 2015, where a husband and wife came into a public building and basically murdered 17 people uh, during a birthday party. Uh, we were asked, invited to submit a piece and our piece is called Curtain of Courage. It's again in this kind of bureaucratic site that sits and having this beautiful view towards the mountain range. The idea of the curtain of courage, we kind of thought of this idea of the bulletproof vest because during that day, people came to the aid. I mean, all of the county police, everyone came to the aid of people here. And so we wanted to create almost a religious experience for people daily. And this idea of creating a curtain that could have layers to it became a basic idea. And along this walkway, we create 17 small, almost chaplets that people wanted. Each family wanted a place they could come and mourn their loss, but they also wanted a place that felt collective, right? And so we created these series of alcoves. And in each alcove, the name of the deceased is there, as long with a piece of glass that the family has actually selected, that's their favorite color. And inside the bench is a keepsake that only the family knows. And so daily, as you move through the space, you move past these curtains. 
And again, it's in Southern California, the light, the shadow, really trying to create something that most passerbys can actually have an impact on, but also those in mourning. And through that light and shadow, this becomes a place that people pass daily, but people also come to over and over and over again. This is actually being constructed now as opening this summer. And the last two projects I wanted to share with you, I wouldn't say are controversial, but they kind of dig deeper into some of these ideas of memory. And particularly this project, I wanna show you more about how decisions were being made collectively through a group to deal with a painful, a painful experience in a place. This is the International African American Museum in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, it's slated to open the fall of 2023. It will be an international center for learning where families and groups can come to understand American history, but particularly the role of African Americans in the Low Country. We inaugurated the site two years ago. Harry Cobb, the architect from Pay Cobb Freed, is the architecture designer. Mayor Riley, Charles Riley, is the mayor for 40 years. He's basically spearheaded the project. And our sister city from the Congo, from West Africa, came over and blessed the site. It's located on the neck of Charleston, if you've been to Charleston. Uh, it's located right next to the aquarium and also the National Park Service. It's located in a space called Gadsden's Wharf. And again, as we're beginning to see in a lot of these landscapes, these landscapes are being discovered. <laughs> and I would push you again to think about, well, why are we just discovering these landscapes? If you look at maps that they sell in Charleston, you will see Gaston's Wharf on there. So it was not lost. It was just not commemorated. To the left here, you see Mother Emanuel Church. This is where the massacre happened what, five, six years ago. Uh, and again, I bring this in. Uh, the families of the deceased here at Mother Emanuel actually forgave the white supremacists from North Carolina who came. And in a way, that's the spirit of Charleston. That's people here who have this very, very empathetic way of seeing themselves in the city, the city that's going through what I would say this really fast change in the last two years. The museum will be it's about as long as a football field. It sits up 13 feet off the ground because this is hurricane country, right? And so from code, you can't have a building sitting flush. The ground floor has to be open and accessible. Harry took that to task and made this very long building. The building was pretty much conceptually designed when we came to the table. And one of the entry points for me was Toni Morrison. And I had, I'm friends with her son and I had I known about the bench by the road where she had been placing benches, you know, indistinct benches in places in the African diaspora throughout North America and um, Western Europe. But after she wrote Beloved, people asked her, well, why did you write Beloved? And she said, there is no place you or I can go to think about or not think about to summon the presences or recollect the absences of slaves. There is no suitable memorial or plaque or wreath or wall or park or skyscraper lobby. There's no 300 foot tower. There's no small bench by the road. So she started placing these benches. Now, since she's done this, we have a skyscraper lobby. Now we have the, what is it, the black burial ground in New York, right? So we got a lobby. We have a little park, I guess you could call it the civil rights, you know, um, lynching museum. But again, what she's getting at is that we need more of these places to talk about because we've been everywhere. Right? And so that was real inspiration for us. And so we convened this group of about 30 people and you can kind of see community advisors, um, board members, staff, uh, developers, architects. And I said, you're gonna be with me for three days. We're gonna walk around the low country and we're gonna talk about these really hard ideas. We're gonna go out to Sullivan's Island and look at the pest houses. We're gonna look at this meager display that they have at Fort Moultrie in the back room that has these horrendous you know, elements and, and sort of this literature and really bad vitrines. I mean, it's a really bad exhibit in this huge thing. And in the right-hand side, two experiences happened there. The top one, the sign, this is Michael Allen of the National Parks. It took him almost 20 years just to get a sign. 
to talk about what was happening here. So that hit me like a brick. The second was the one down below is the architect um, and a historian and they're photographing Toni Morrison's plaque that says basically what I just read. And that's the only thing out there that's descriptive enough to have power. And again, that made me just feel really sad to a certain degree that the only thing we could actually photograph of any consequences was something that was actually contemporary and not historical. And so going back to the site, we were able to sort of find the map that shows the uh, warehouse down here, the warehouse, the way slavery worked in Charleston from the Atlantic crossing to Fort Moultrie, Slaves were put into pest houses, washed clean, incubated. Those who survived were then taken through the harbor and brought to Gaston's Wharf and placed in the warehouse. The warehouse then only opened when there was sale. And of course, slaves perished in this place as well. We found the line. The line exists, again, back from the bulkhead today. We sit up currently seven to eight feet above um, the water height for the tide. And so we were able to dig down archaeologically and they actually found the warehouse and they actually found items that were in turn back and some will actually be in the museum itself. We marked it uh, and got people to kind of really think about that spatial sense that was there. And then we took trips to Middleton Place plantations. We went to Phillips, some of the settlements that are still Gullah, which are part of the Gullah, as you guys know, um, landscape that goes from North Carolina all the way to Florida. And then we ended at Mother Emanuel Church for service. Out of that, we came up with 21 different concepts. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. And this is the way we tend to work. We don't do three schemes. We try to sort of put out as many scenarios as possible to talk about things. And we might not end there, but these scenarios help us work through various ideas. So everything from holograms to clouds and figures to steles to remembrance, historic recollections, towers, offerings, piers, badges, tabby, the middle passage, um, amphitheaters, moving earth, brick topography, brick vaults. So all of these began to have conversations to the site through simple sketches and modeling we were able then to kind of think about these ideas, holograms projected on the columns, chains hanging from the soffit of the building at night, the chains are broken, uh, projecting out into the water. What if our ancestors rose out of the harbor? Clouds and figures, what if we had corpses overhead and you had to walk through the corpses because again, we knew people died and suffered in the space. Now, you know, the city is freaking out by now what I'm doing, I'm showing all of these. They're going, holy cow, we can't do this stuff, right? Uh, putting bodies under the soffit, right? A uh, thousand steles, grabbing rock from different diaspora and talking about, you know, the numbers that came across the Atlantic crossing, flooding the underside, again, using the Brooks map, uh, creating tabby, which is this um, concrete that's made of crushed shells and sand and making mounds of them, almost like Opus Africana, like the uh, Romans made in Rome, or building with brick that have, has a transparency. If you walk through Charleston, you can still see the fingers of boys and girls who were making the actual brick. Or let's just buy a boat and take people out to Sullivan Island, right? Or let's rebuild the pier that went out and grab rock from Bunch Island in Africa. Or let's just, just do a place where you come and actually provide offerings. This really scared people. You know, <laughs> fire everywhere lit along the harbor. Uh, or badges. You know, Charleston was one of the few places, thank God, where you could loan out your slaves. And so when you loaned out your slave, you had to wear a badge and you had to say what your occupation was. And so here we've decided, let's make columns where you come, everyone who comes makes a badge and over time they fill up. Uh, or can we reshape the, the ground plane as they did for the growing of rice uh, along the rivers? Or again, you know, using some of the historical brick to talk about the numbers that came across uh, in the Atlantic crossing or subverting the ground plane because slaves had to, work in the, had to walk in the street, they couldn't walk in the sidewalk. 
So what if the ground lifted up and you could actually go into the street and create these cavernous experiences? And out of that, we've deduced these down to four. <laughs> this first one, again, from the ground coming up, it was immediately thrown away because Charleston has a code that you cannot block the view of the water, right? So this hump that came up blocked the view of the water. So that was a, a no brainer. But I really love this scheme because this was the one where you could actually go under the ground and it would be this moment where you, there would be you know, people coming together. It was almost like double, one outside, one inside. Or clouds and figures where the entire ground plane underneath was using the Brooks map and laying figures out and allowing the water to sort of puddle within that. And then looking back along the warehouse, actually having you know, the bodies that were in there in turn and having the names on the wall. Badges and steles and chains. Again, this is all about the accoutrements of slavery, but they actually create a field pattern where the badges again become almost like the columns and they have light. And the, the idea around this one would be, you know, I would have a badge here, Obama would have a badge here, but you would also see badges of servants and things like that. And it would show that amazing resilience over time and the steles and the broken chains. And lastly, the Still I Rise was probably the most landscape of the schemes, but it dealt more with the warehouse where we put bodies in a hole and then you had to walk through the gauntlet of bodies within that warehouse. And the final design, after going through all of these, the conversations I would have to say were pretty powerful. I mean, a lot of the elder people did not want bodies and things like that. They were like, we can't really, you know, put those things on the ground hanging. People didn't want that. The city wouldn't let us do anything in the water because of the salt. But out of that, we really started having this conversation about what could be powerful and what kind of experience that we wanted. And so the final plan looks like this. To the north is sort of a low country landscape that riffs off of a French garden, which a lot of the plantation landscapes does. And so they almost look like parterres. To the south, you see the warehouse. There's a gauntlet that you go through. There's an ethnobotanic garden, but the entire underside of the building is made of tabby. So it's as if you're like in the bottom of the sea of the Atlantic Ocean, you see shales and things like that. And then along the right-hand side, we have the Atlantic Crossing Fountain. So coming from the city, we created this primary dune, these kind of exaggerated landforms that take you in, but they also block the city. You kind of see the tabby on the ground that comes up to the columns. The columns are two meters wide. Sweet grass on the north side, sweet grass is a grass that gets inundated, but is also used for basket making. We wanted to basically make sure we had those there on the site. The steles talk about the different regions of Africa people came from, so there will be different dialects coming out of the rocks themselves. And then the ethnobotanical garden speaks to the plants that the seeds that women brought in their head and the other transference of flora. Made these rice planters where we propagate rice, where we can hold them in water so people could actually see Carolina go rice on the site. And then looking back across to the warehouse, we have now a single black wall on one side and a reflective wall on the inside where you walk through a gauntlet where you have to come into terms with rice negroes kneeling down and you really kind of are part of that experience just for a moment. And these are being done uh, by our studio. Um, they're now becoming much more abstracted. We've had a conversation about around abstraction of black bodies and what does that really mean in North America? And then at night, we light it like the rest of Charleston. If you've been to Charleston, you can actually do ghost tours of Charleston, right? Where they take you around telling all these stories. We want this place to be just like those other places, places where you come and you actually will have this spiritual, right, experience even in the evening time. And then the fountain itself, looking at the Brooks map and seeing how the bodies are tied head to toe and really thinking about how the water since it's seven feet below, how do we make this moment happen? And so we created an infinity fountain where we basically create a pool of water that sits above the bulkhead. We're using tabby to actually inscribe the figures. These were our first figures, which we didn't like. 
And these are the next ones where we have a reveal and we actually put the actual pieces with inside the piece. And you can sort of see here the shales, the kind of quality we're looking at for that. When you get close, it becomes really abstracted. And then when you serialize them head to toe, this is black concrete with the aggregate in the middle. And then a band, a stainless steel band along that edge, that's the line that we're actually marking that I showed earlier, that archeological line, which is not you know, perpendicular to the building. And then the view back out to the harbor when the fountain's full, and then when it drains, when it falls, and when it drains. This is the construction site. These are the exaggerated dunes that are taking place today. This project is, again, we're a year out. Um, but you get this view from the fire stair looking along the ethnobotanical garden. You see the steelays going up. You see the wall and the sweet grass coming in to the north. And then the fountain itself is being laid and being tested. And this idea that the wall comes into the fountain and gets flooded. You can kind of see the figures up above looking back down towards the sweet grass as well. And when you look at the figures, you almost get this kind of topography that begins to happen. And then looking at them, it's almost as if the concrete is laid on top of the tabby, right? When the two come together. And what we're interested in is just that little puddle that's left, right? And so the light would change as you move around. This fills up twice a day. So sometimes you'll come, it'll be empty. And sometimes you'll come, it'll be full. And this is that testing of the fountain right now. So some days you'll come and you'll just see a piece of water. And when the water moves out, the figures will emerge. The last project I wanna show with you is the opposite of this project. If, if that project I just showed was about the low country and our ancestors, Double Sites is about someone radically different than myself that I had to learn about. It's about Woodrow Wilson. And in this days of reckoning, um, everybody has been called out. And the black students at Princeton went to the president's office, locked themselves in, handful of students, and said, we want Woodrow Wilson's name off the public policy building. I'll let you guys do the research on Wilson. He uh, was a very interesting man. This is opening day. This is the best opening day of a project I've ever had. These are the students out still protesting his name. Because when the students went to the president's office, the trustees put together some money to do a competition, to do a marker about Wilson's good deeds and bad deeds. And that's what the, 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 the brief said. We ended up winning the competition. Um, there is Woodrow. <laughs> um, but I needed a way to talk about this person and I didn't have a way. And so I, I wanted to use the boats and the boats is a contemporary. And I wanted to kind of think about this idea of the double consciousness and the veil. And so I call the piece double consciousness. And over time working with the student body, the Afro department, it became double sites. Um, double sites kind of reverses the idea of the consciousness, right? And really talks about the person actually looking back at the veil. And this notion that I wanted, if I could give him a conscious, what would that be? What would it look like? And so on the campus, in the heart of the campus at the top, the site is located in a very public place, uh, Scott Plaza. Here we have the Fountain of Freedom and we have the Queen Nail Rothschild trees. These are all gifts to the university. And this is a very simple idea. We took a square, cut it along a diagonal, made one white and one black. The black column supports the white. To me, this is like, that's the project to me. But of course it had to have a pedagogical layer to it. And this idea of the pedagogical layer was on the inside, let's put ideas of his detractors on the inside and on the outside, let's have all of Wilson's words unedited. It's a 39 foot high piece. It's located, we took out two trees, placed it in. And then the words by his contemporaries are put there in stainless steel so that you can actually see it. You know, they're really powerful words by Trotter, by Woodley, by James Weldon Johnson. And then on the outside, we show Wilson's uh, 
work in education, labor policy, foreign policy, women's sub segregation, unedited. And the piece sits as a sentinel in this plaza. You see the faces of the contemporaries, we put them on the inside. So it's like opening him up and showing you the people who were pushing him and he completely ignored. And the inside reflects the context around it, which is the school. And his words, you have to get up really close to read them. And a funny thing happened. We opened this 2019 fall, George Floyd 2020, the summer of 2020, one of the trustees came out. They had been voting to keep the name. And one of the trustees came out and actually read some of the quotes on the piece and it changed her vote. They voted the name off. Um, and now this is the only thing that sits in the plaza with any recollection of Wilson. His name is not on the marker. The piece is called Double Sights. Again, the detractors are the central piece here where we see Booker, where we see Ida B. Wells. They're in lenticular as you move from side to side. Um, and they create just this different experience at the center of this campus, which is, has this long legacy in history of racism. Thank you. Outstanding, my goodness. <laughs> Well, thank you so I'll much. stop sharing right there. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Walter. That was, um, I'm inspired to go in the studio and start drafting, and I know these students are. Too, so thank you so much for that. Um, now we'll open the floor up to questions for uh, about 15 minutes before we close out. So I'll take questions from anyone. I'm seniors, you got to leave the right. Question about process, any of the designs we just saw. By the way, he maybe approaches or thinks about things. How do you even come up with some of those things? Um, hi, my name is Chris Thomas. Um, hey, Chris, what's up? <laughs> if you ever feel as though you're stuck, what are what are your ways that you um work through that, or what are ways that you um, decompress past that? I normally just do something different, <laughs> right? I mean, I just think, you know, design is one of these things where you can't turn it on or off, right? It's one of those things where I, I find I just have to put myself in a place. And so I surround myself with the, the right accoutrements and things like that. But, you know, I do a lot of things. I paint, I read a lot, I, you know, like sports. Most of the time, you know, if I'm like lost or whatever, I just watch a movie, man. <laughs> something completely, you know, not real, something that takes me. <laughs> but, you know, I think there's too much sort of given to, you know, not thinking about yourself as, again, I talked about this earlier about liberal arts, but yeah, really course. trying to feed yourself in a lot of different ways. You know, I don't look at Landscape Architecture Magazine. I can't remember the last time I looked at architectural landscape projects. I don't know what's going on in the world, right? But I do look at other things because what I found was the more I was looking at landscape architecture magazine, architecture magazine, that stuff was getting stuck in my head. And I would actually, it would actually come out and I'm looking, it's like, how do I end up there? That's been done already, right? And so really trying to feed yourself in just a lot of different ways. And, and Mr. Hood, I, I would first say, Thank you very much for just an incredible lecture. It was all inspiring. Uh, and uh, I did want to go back to uh, the comment you just touched on a few seconds ago, and that is the valuing of the liberal arts. And throughout your incredible lecture, I saw the evidence of the liberal arts history uh, and the social sciences, in addition to the constrained way many of us think of landscape architecture. Uh, and how, how do you advise these uh, bright students uh, to think differently as you've shown in your uh, lecture today, the importance and significance of 
the liberal arts, the social sciences, and how it shapes our thinking about landscape architecture. Well, I, I mean, I mean, I think for for those of us, particularly at the HBCU, I think we have to begin to question, you know, again, these settings, right? And I didn't question until I graduated. And I started having this internal conversation between Booker T. Washington and DeVos, right? I was trained in the Booker T. Washington School. I, when I got out of a and I could draw rings around people. Mm-hmm. I mean, I could draft, I, could, I mean, literally, I could like do it all. But the one thing I, I found myself limited by was my capacity to think in multidimensional ways that was not tied to the art of landscape architecture or the practice of land. I wouldn't even say art, the practice of landscape architecture. And I remember taking an art history class one summer at a and and I was blown away. I'm sitting there like, why are we not learning this in landscape, right? And so there was this notion that, okay, I'm in this place, but there's all this other stuff here. And slowly I then started to kind of just feed myself, right? And when I went and got my master's, it was my liberal arts education. I stayed at Berkeley four years. People were like, it's only a two year program. I'm like, I want to be here for four years. You know what I mean? But literally just really finding ways to make connections to things that I thought were disconnected, right? Baldwin, I mean, it's like, why wasn't I thinking of Baldwin? <laughs> you know what I mean, but, but again, really bringing these things in because they can give you the courage and the power to step out of line, yeah. right? And I think that's the big thing. I think designers are looking for answers, metrics, the right way to do things. And what I'm saying, there is no right way, <laughs> yes. right? I mean, there's a way in which, you know, you don't want to be sued. So of course you want to do things for health, safety, and welfare, but there is no right way in design. So these books, whether it's, you know, um, Ching, I mean, there are all these books that I read as a landscape architect that taught me how to draw, but it made things so standard that my work looked like everybody else's. And so one of the things we do in my studio is if it doesn't look strange, we haven't done our work. And we use that term in a very liberal way, but it's got to look different. It can't look like the rest of the stuff out there. Outstanding. Thank you. Mr. Hood, um, I just love your very first slide or one of the first slides where you had the meter that showed the timeline of American history. I thought I thought I had this down, but when you put it in perspective like that, and then right in the middle of your arch, you know, of course, uh, uh, Bishop, Bishop Richard Allen, uh, Bishop Morris Brown founded the AME Church, and I put a question in the chat. And so the AME Church and other uh, Black churches were for a place for you to be buried. Yep. Like I said, like at, at Monticello, you'd be buried out in the woods. Yep. But here we go. Now, because of prosperity, thank goodness, of the uh, uh, African-Americans being educated by schools like a t and other HBCUs, the descendants move away from these areas where the f- bur- burial grounds are, and it's dotted all through the South. Mm-hmm. It's not really a question. I just worry for these beautiful landscapes, what's going to happen when the descendants are no longer close to the cemeteries, who who is going to maintain uh, any no. semblance of uh, the value? Yep. No one, right? I mean, they basically going to disappear. My mother was buried in Middle North Carolina, Angier, Angier, North Carolina, and me and my sisters twenty years ago we went back to the church because we were going to put a headstone. The church was gone, and therefore we couldn't even locate the burial ground. And um, so it's a thing where I mean. We have to be more powerful in how we present these places, right? And that's why, you know, the the piece at UVA, it was interesting when we went out to look at these historic places, there are these, um, how can I say, uh, there are wonderful ways to tell those stories that might help with their preservation, right? Because I think we have to make them important. If we don't make them important, they will become right indispensable. And so whether we mark them in different ways or tell different, I use the term stories, because if you think of the landscape out there and you go to some cemeteries, I mean, those stories are pretty powerful. Right? I mean, my father is buried in an Italian cemetery in Charlotte. 
right? I mean, that ain't going away, man. You know, I mean, it's laid out. It has a power to it. And I think we have to give power to these places, you know, and, and I think that's our job, you know, to a certain degree to say these are important places. And again, through our, our memories, but also through folklore, these other ways that we have to make them come to life. I know that's a pun, right? I mean, but we have to bring them to life for people to see that they should respect these places. And I don't think just putting a sign is going to do it, right? The sign is not about sort of expressing what's below the ground. Carrington, a question? Um, I was wondering, like, when you're actually researching a site, like looking at the history, how do you pick and choose what parts of that history you want to include? And like, are you sketching as well as your Research? Well, I, I was trying to show that in the Charleston project, you know, it's very subjective. You know, this is the thing. It's like, to me, there's no right one. And I will argue with anyone. I mean, I chose to bring this back. Someone else working on the project might choose to bring something else back. But I think that's the, that should be the beauty of our work, right? That, you know, if Dr. Goins was working on a project and he chose like in Charleston to talk more about rice, I think that's fine. I chose to talk more about the, the corpses. But again, I think we just need people to make those decisions versus being afraid to choose something to bring forward. And I think we're too conservative that way, that we're afraid because we think someone's going to disagree. Right? So I got to get it right. There is no right. <laughs> I mean, our history is so like, <laughs> I don't know if you guys, I mean, you look at the history, it is so... Uh, how can I say layered, right? And subjective what you bring back. Um, you know, I love this term by Baldwin. Baldwin once said that, you know, black folk, we're born knowing our history, right? And in a way, a lot of Americans are not born knowing that history and are actually told fictions. So again, that's the place where we need to do the work, right? to put those stories out and have conversations about them, right? The ones that differ. So I would push you to just, you know, grab something and put it out there. Yeah. And yeah. Hi, my name is Danielle Freeman Jefferson. Um, hey, hi, <laughs> I, um, I wanted to ask you about, I, want, I wanted to ask you to talk a bit more about um, Earlier, you were saying that there are some landscapes that are not necessarily lost, but not commemorated. And I know I've been, for my capstone, I've been looking a lot at um, post-industrial cities, and I've been encountering a lot of landscapes like that. Because So um, if you could talk about kind of like how you find them or like what they, what their niche is, I guess. Um. I mean, they're there. They're just been erased. I mean, they've been erased from our view. Um, the director of the African American Museum in DC once said, "Bunch, Lonnie Bunch, you know, it's in plain view, right? That's just out there." So one thing that you know, one of the first things we do in a lot of urban places, we use the fire maps, Sanborn maps, and those are the early fire maps, and they are actually racialized. A lot of them will actually say. Negro, Negro church or something. They I mean literally very early in the 20th century, the urban maps are actually raci highly racialized. But it's also, you know, if you're curious, right, you go to Detroit and people talk about Black Bottom in Detroit. But Black Bottom is also where the Mies sort of project is that every architect sort of goes to but they don't talk about Black Bottom, they talk about Mies. <laughs> and so it's there, it's just that people choose to not want to exhume it because it, be, it begins to conflict then. So how can you like look at Mies and Black Bottom together, right? I mean, it's not like you have to choose, but when you look at them together, Mies looks a little different, <laughs> right? And so again, some of these challenge how we've actually set up the profession to a certain degree. But these spaces are everywhere, right? Right where you are at AT. You know, why is AT where it is? What was there before AT? You know, you start to ask these questions. Um, I was doing a project when I was a student at Berkeley, and I was intrigued by the housing project I lived at in Charlotte, right? 
And I did this research, a very simple research, and it, it, it proved to me why we have roaches, <laughs> right? Because we were on a landfill. Found out it was a freaking landfill. And like the Orkin man was always at our crib. I wrote this article about the Orkin man was always there. But it was because we were living on a landfill, basically dump. And that's where black folk had to live. And so, of course, it wasn't because we were dirty that we had roaches. It was because the landscape they gave us that we were in. But once you start to question these things, you actually see the causalities of a lot of things. And so I would just push you like every project doesn't matter where it is. There was always something there. And we choose to look at landscapes like they're empty, right? I like to think about the ghosts, right? The ghosts are always there, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Hood, my name is Joaquin Lloyd. Um, from looking at your presentation, I see that you go through a lot of concept and a lot of different ideas. How do you balance um, integrating all of those different ideas to make the project um, that you're working on work um, in the sense that everything that you chose it goes together to create that narrative that you're trying to emphasize. Oh, that's hard, man. I mean, you know, you just keep going, you know. <laughs> and of course, I drive my staff, my office crazy because they want to just stop and get the project done, right? <laughs> I'm constantly like... No, we got to try this and try this. And I don't know. It's like, it's like asking, you know, a musician or a painter, when is it done? Right. A lot of times it's done because there's a deadline. <laughs> right. And I'm just being real. It's like you guys in studio. It's like projects due tomorrow. OK, make a make, you got to make a decision. And but again, I was telling the young I think it was the young lady who had asked the question earlier. You know, if you put enough things out there in front of you. Right. And I see this is the thing that is lax with my students. They're afraid to just throw everything against the wall, no matter what. Just put it out there. Right. Like I will ask them, they'll give me like alternatives versus give me real designs. So these are not alternatives. And I figure if you look at one thing and you study it hard enough, look at another thing and study it hard enough and go through like 20 things, but you actually arrive at something, it's then easy to make decisions versus just sketching, right? And not having resolution around the idea. Thank you. One of, my, one of my professors used to talk about prolificity. And I think Steve was getting at this very early. <laughs> you know, if, if the professor asks you to do three drawings, you should do 10, mm. right? I mean, this is the idea is that if someone's asking you, you know, to, do one model, do five models, because they're basically just giving you a baseline. Because if they didn't give you the baseline, you wouldn't do anything. <laughs> if I told my students, okay, here's the project, just do the work, they wouldn't do anything. So I would have to lay it out, but always the prolificity of it. I think the more you can put out there, the more you'll actually see how you're actually making decisions. Okay. No. <laughs> How you doing? My name is Gino Austin. What's up, man? Uh, so it's an honor to talk to a bunch of But um, my question it goes back to the International African American Museum. Uh, uh, one thing I wanted to touch bases on is the fact that um, you can get very emotionally connected with some uh, design or something like that. So uh, my thing for you is, um, as a designer, you know, you, you create one design and you you be emotionally connected to that design. And so you do, you create another design and you're like, okay, I need to bring something from that to this design. <laughs> so how do you fight through that? Like, how do you get through that aspect of design? Uh, you definitely saw that. Like some of the stuff, man, I wanted to like have holograms. I wanted stuff coming out of the water. You know, I wanted all that stuff. But I knew on one hand that one, that the museum couldn't curate a lot of that, right? And so there were things that, you know, like the figures were something that we knew we, we were interested in, but we didn't know how they were going to manifest. But the badges is one that I wanted to bring forward, right? Um, but the badges didn't make it. So as we're going through the process, now we have a new director. And so the director came in and was like, Walter, you know, I know you guys have like done all this work, but I need to like put my stamp on this thing. Can you show me where you've been? And of course, I brought out the stuff. <laughs> 
So we're getting badges. Uh, <laughs> so you know, you know, they're there, you know. And the other piece to this that I learned, and this is more I learned this through art, um, is, and some of my artist friends, you know, through all these ideas we come up with on a project, it helps other projects. So we're working on other projects and we go, well, we were thinking about this in that project that we didn't use and it comes to other projects. And so in a way, our projects have their own diaspora, right? Their own way of working together. And I think, again, while you're in school, you're gonna see, begin to see your go-to moves, right? <laughs> you're gonna be like, why do I go to this all the time, right? So those are things that you should be aware of. Right, or the kinds of things that you're interested in. So if they don't make one project, they can actually make another project. Other questions, we have some more time. Hi, my name is Shakira Hood. Um, as you stated before- What's your last name? Hood. <laughs> <laughs> Long girl, what's up? You my cousin? Where are you from? Uh, I was born in Charlotte, but I lived in New York. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! That's so cool. I gotta like figure out if we might be connected. Possibly. What's um, up? <laughs> as you said it before, your projects are super unique, super cool, amazing, and out of the norm for most AMP architects. Have you received any negative feedback from those who may not understand your work, and what how how you responded to those? Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, a lot of, I just remember very early in my career, ASLA, one of my, came to an exhibit that I did, and it was in San Francisco, but it was about a Black neighborhood. And they call my drawing South Mark. I, I always remember that. Um, because they were just different drawing, kinds of drawings. I've also had the critique of Walter doesn't use enough plants in his projects, right? Or things like, you know, those kinds of things, because it's being compared, like you say, to kind of mainstream landscape architecture. Uh, but, you know, to me, critique is critique. You know, some people are gonna like your work and some people are not gonna like your work. Some people are gonna get your work and some people are not gonna get your work. The work to me is not, particularly if it's public work, not everybody's gonna get it because our public is a very diverse public. And, you know, one of the things I refuse to do is dilute the work down to the least common denominator. And that's what happens. If you look around most of our landscapes, that's how they're built. They're built so that no one <laughs> has any issue with them, right? I mean, it's kind of like, oh, nice trees. Oh, a nice design. Oh, nice fountain. Oh. I mean, nothing. And I was challenging, you know, my... A and T people here, you know, I was saying I came on campus and I don't know your campus anymore. Scott Hall is gone. All of my memories on campus are erased. And I don't think that's a good thing. I think we always think that we need new stuff, but the new stuff is not connecting us to our past. You know, there were there were bullet holes in Scott Hall wall. I could touch those bullet holes and those bullet holes connected me to the class in 68. Right, they're gone now. You know, so, so when I come to the campus, it's an alien place for me. And I think these are things that if we choose to always want to keep up with the Joneses, you know, the Joneses are giving us the wrong stuff, you know, because the Joneses don't tear stuff down. The Joneses have stuff left from like 1700 when you actually look at it. So, so again, I think, you know, how we actually do our work, we just have to like develop enough calluses where we're able to take the critique, you know? And again, I've had bad reviews and I've had good reviews, but that's just the way it is, right? And I think, you know, I've had clients, I've been fired. I hate it being fired. Um, I've only been fired once, <laughs> but it really hurt me, but I understand it. And I'm glad, and I'm glad I didn't do the project because in the end, they didn't want to do what I wanted to do. I have a question. Hello, yes, Mr. Sir. Uh, my name is uh, Jose Carcamo. Nice to meet you. What's up, Jose? Um, what's up? Earlier, you mentioned that when choosing between diversity and difference, you usually, uh, you usually pick difference. Mm -hmm. How do you know for sure during the design process that you're um, 
your design is truly different um, when compared to other projects? Oh, come on, that's a pretty easy one for landscape architecture. <laughs> but right. do, you, do you base it off of what you know or what others tell you? Like, if, do you base it off of if somebody tells you that it's different or because the, that's what you believe and that's what you know? It's not what I believe, it's just what I see, right? I mean, again, uh, we're tied to standardization, right? Colonialization is about making everything the same, right? It's like, I don't know how many times I've talked to the city. It's like, oh, all the trees need to be the same species on, on the street. Like, why? I mean, what kind of rule is that, right? Or trees have to be spaced 24 feet on center, right? I mean, plant trees five feet on center, they'll be different. <laughs> right? I mean, look at Dan Kiley's work. I mean, Dan Kiley is planting trees seven feet on center, right, to make geometry. His work is different. And so it's those kinds of things. So I don't mean like a different color. I'm just talking about how we make decisions about things, right? Why is it that I have to choose furniture out of a book? Why can't I design my own furniture, right? Why can't every piece, every light post in the city be different? Why do they have to come from Canada? <laughs> why do I have to use the historic acorn light? I, I mean, why do I have to make those playgrounds out of that plant? Why do I have to choose the plastic stuff, right? And so when you look in history that people who made difference, Noguchi said, I'm not doing plastic playgrounds. Look at Noguchi playgrounds. They're pieces of sculpture. They're different <laughs> and they're really, they're so different that they're worth almost mi millions and millions of dollars because they're valued because they're different, right? And so it's not then about, you know, again, this is, it's, 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 it's not really subjective, it's objective. We know the things that we do, right? And again, those simple things, how do you just have a different point of view? And I think it's, it's really hard to do because you're gonna be challenged. You know, the street tree guy is going to go, the trees can't touch, man, the trees can't touch. And then you got to figure out a way to show them trees touching, <laughs> right? And that, that's a good thing that trees touch. <laughs> it's crazy some of the stuff, man. You know, when you look at how standardized the practices have become and how, how afraid people are, though, to make those other decisions, right? It's almost as if they're written in some kind of Bible somewhere. But in actuality, you know, one of my uh, professors, Alan Jacobs, bless his heart, you know, he used to say, you know, someone sat in a room and came up with a standard. Someone was like, okay, we need a standard for trees. Um, let's just make them 30 feet on center. Okay, sounds good to me. But there's no like ecological or rational way about that, right? Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Hey, Ms. Hood, I have a question for Miss Hood. Look up Jay Hood. Jay Hood? Yeah, that's my nephew. <laughs> He's from New York. <laughs> what part of New York? Uh, Yonkers. Okay. He's a good rapper, actually. Check out his music. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Mr. Hood? Can we email you? Can we email you? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Gotta make sure you say you're from a and because if not, I'll just delete it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we did have some students that were asking before my, my studio about uh, potential. I know we talked about this internship opportunity, this discovery program with, um, with Berkeley. What about with Hood Studios? Uh, we have interns. Um, I don't know if we're going to be doing them this summer, but just send your portfolio and applications. If you can go on our website, you'll find the, you know, the web number and everything to submit it. All right. Cool. All right. Well, thank you. you have another question? Uh, yes. I just want to comment, uh, Mr. Wood, thank you so much for an outstanding uh, lecture. I certainly enjoyed it, and I, I'm thinking I'm on the wrong track. I should be, should have been a landscape architect. I mean, this is really outstanding, and I love the, the questioning the mold and, and then thinking out of the box and, and then all of the, the, the good thing and the merging of, you know, uh, art and humanities with landscape architecture. And that brings me to 
how can we add um, courses in our curriculum to bring that dimension so that that enrich uh, our students and and then that's that's something that probably could could be done easily i know that we have the accreditation but we can work around it in terms of uh, of bringing that dimension to the program no, i think one of the simplest you know ways of doing this uh, is through the studio course that there is a seminar associated with this. You probably already have this. I mean, this is where we try to inseminate, you know, other ideas and that's through the seminar. And the seminar, a lot of the times, is only one day a week for two to three hours, but there's readings. Um, and I know students love readings, right, guys? <laughs> Thank you enough. But really, you know, bringing readings in and really having a conversation about, you know, how can that begin to infiltrate how we think? Because they're not about, you know, oh, this is the best way to design. They're just other ideas. I'll give you an example. We've been reading um, Baldwin, uh, his semi-autobiography, and there's a Go Tell It on the Mountain. And there's a scene in Go Tell It on the Mountain where young Jim Grimes, you know, his dad gives him, his mom gives him money. He lives in Harlem. His mom gives him money to go on his birthday to go downtown. And he runs to his favorite hill. And his hill is in Central Park. And there's this moment where he talks about, he runs up this hill and he sees the city and he's like this amazing person, right? And he's going to, I'm king of the hill, blah, blah, blah. And slowly he starts to remember where he is. And so he runs down the hill and he bumps into an old white guy. And he's about to apologize to the white guy and the white guy winks and he makes his way out to Fifth Avenue. Now, when I read that years ago, I was like, oh, that's an interesting thing. But when I read it today, it's about Olmsted. It's about Central Park. It's about the way Olmsted talked about the gregaria, you know, the people coming together in Central Park. And it became a critique for me then. Right, because again, Baldwin is actually experiencing that kind of space. And so when you start to like, again, think about people who are experiencing these landscapes and those that write about them, maybe they have things to help us understand some of the issues that we're dealing with. It's like Toni Morrison's Bench by the Road. It's all of those things and really trying to connect back, right, to this larger net, right, of critique in our culture, so. Go for it. Thank you. I look forward to seeing all the applications from you guys for the summer. Um, the weather out here is really awesome. <laughs> <laughs> In the summer, it's not as hot. <laughs> it's got a nice cool <laughs> wind. Yes. There's no humidity in Oakland. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you so Any much. Um, questions or comments? Sierra, yes. Um, hi, I'm Sierra Knight, and my question was just, I know towards the very, very beginning of your talk, you mentioned, like, uh, you know, if there's something that you don't really understand, you just have to go with it, and, like, that's really how you, you know, get good things out of it, and I know you mentioned, like, liberal arts being important, and those are things that I really love, but I have been kind of putting those to the side, thinking that I need to do that to have more time in my, to actually create my designs. And I was just wondering, like, do you think, you know, spending more time with it and actually would help my forms and things like that? Trying to understand the question. I think I understand it. I mean, one is, I mean, it's incredibly time consuming to learn the craft. Would you guys agree? Yeah. Right? Yes. I mean, just learn, just, just learning the craft, that just the practice is, is like really, really, really hard. But I always think about it as I used to run track and I, I always think about this because my track coach never came to practice. He would always just put the freaking list on the wall. And it was like five, two twenties, 10, four forties, 12, eight. I mean, basically practice. We never talked about racing. It was just freaking practice. And this went on for six weeks, right? And I'm going, I'm running the quarter. Why do I need to do sprints? Why do I need to do all this stuff? And so the first time I went out, I cheated. 
<laughs> right? I did like two of these, two of these. Race day came. <laughs> my first race, the monkey caught me in the last curve, right? I couldn't even finish. My legs felt like jello. Coach is yelling at me. And he said, you didn't practice. And so one hand, the stuff that we, that we learn is just practice, right? A lot of it is practice. The CAD, all of that stuff you're learning, it's just practice. Learning your plants, it's just practice. The other side to it, though, is thinking. And to me, a lot of those things are really different. So some of those are, are just kind of mundane things. And to me, when I learned to draw, those are just mundane things. I just learned. I just did it over and over and over and over again. I didn't give it much thought. The thinking part is the harder part, and that's where you go deep. And that's through reading, through all of those other things. And there's a moment where those things come together. So I just would not cheat yourself in one or the other. The practicing is going to be hard and it's arduous, but it's meant to be that way to learn. And I think today learning is just one of these things that I always ask my students. I say, how do you learn? And they look at me and this is kind of, I'm like, how do you learn? Because I know the way I learn is through practice. And so I would push you guys to figure out ways to practice, but also to practice, if that makes sense, right? Because again, some of the stuff is just mundane and it takes a long time to get good at something. I forget how many hours you have to do something to get, I mean, that's a lot of time it takes, but I would put the time in. I mean, when I was in school, there was a cohort of us who like, like five or six of us who we just were in studio all the time. And it would be like, we'd be like, where are you going to studio? Where are you going to studio? I mean, the studio was the destination. And so I think while you're in school, it has to be, and then you're free from it, the practice, it will pay off, trust me. Thank you so much, that was beautiful. What, wait, one more comment, yes, go ahead. Uh, Hi, Walter. Uh, my name is Wilson. Uh, do you consider yourself a landscape architect or more of an artist that works with structure and land? Well, I consider myself more a designer. Um, I have, since my practice has kind of built out, I'm like the creative uh, director of my studio. I have degrees in art, landscape architecture, architecture, and urban design. Um, and very early, I wanted to, uh, I wanted all of those, all of that practice to shape how I practice, right? And so, again, I saw very, for me, and this is just a, a decision I made for myself, I found landscape architecture very limiting to answer some of the questions that I had. And I didn't feel that, you know, just through the medium, the way it was being presented to me, that I could actually go somewhere with it. So I had to add more things to the medium. And so I use design as a very broad tool. Um, and I don't like to say art versus design. You know, I wanna make art for work, but I also wanna make work in places where people are not privileged to have beauty, to have spaces that people think about in a multi-dimensional way. I think to me, that's the only way that I can actually provide that is to make sure that it's multi-dimensional. Okay. That's beautiful. All right, well, I think with that, we'll uh, close out. Thank you so much, Walter, for your time. It's a warm applause for the Thank you guys. I look forward to seeing you guys all. And I wish you well in your education. And I know COVID has thrown us for a loop, but hey, we'll get through it all. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you, leadership, for coming as well. Thank you, Dr. Goins, Dr. Linda. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Right. Walter, take care. Talk to you soon, Steve. All right, talk to you soon. Okay. <laughs> all right.